I was working a duty day at the Dorchester District Court in Boston. On those days, I came to the first session where cases are arranged, and I was assigned defendants who could not afford a lawyer. I met Francis in the audience. He fired me down as I was leaving the courtroom to take a cigarette break. He said, hey, sir, I think you're my lawyer. I checked the arrest list, which had my initials next to every third name, and he was right. When Francis got arrested for possession of marijuana with the intent to distribute, he had posted bail at the police station, $500. I reassured him that since he had already posted a substantial bail, and since he came to court of his own accord, after he got arraigned, he was almost certainly free to leave, no problem. Still, I asked him all the usual bail argument questions about his address and where he went to school. He told me he was a senior at BC High, a Jesuit high school in Boston. It was where my father and two uncles had graduated. It was prestigious in general, but especially to me. My dad went there, I said. It's a really tough school. Yes, it is, he said. Wow, that's great, I said. That's really something. Francis smiled at this. I opened my file and glanced over the police report. His last name was unfamiliar to me, a jumble of letters, mostly vowels. I asked him how to pronounce it, which he did. Then I asked, hey, Francis, were you born in the Boston area? He shook his head and told me he was born in Uganda. Are you a citizen, I asked. He shook his head. Francis, I want you to call me tomorrow for an appointment to come and see me. There are two ways to beat a drug case. You can go to trial and prove the drugs don't belong to the, to the defendant. That's the hard way, because by then you've incurred the risk of trial jeopardy, being found guilty, and going to jail for a mandatory minimum of two years if there's a school zone charge attached to the complaint, and the whole city of Boston is a school zone. <laughs> the other way is to file a motion to suppress and have the drug evidence thrown out due to an illegal search. Without the drug evidence, there is no case. That was the safer way to go since even if you lost the motion, you could still offer a plea deal for less than jail time. But in order to succeed in the motion to suppress, you needed evidence of an illegal search, enough to convince a judge to allow your motion and toss out the evidence. I sat in my office and reviewed Francis' police report. His case wasn't an easy one. The auto stop was by the book, and even though I thought the search of his book bag was unjustified, I figured pretty much any judge would accept it and deny our motion to suppress. The judges were all former prosecutors, mostly. Cop lovers and law and order types, I muttered to myself. I sat over my open file, rancorously reciting my beliefs. The Constitution promises this, but they give you that, especially if you're poor and black. Privacy rights aren't for everybody, just the chosen. By that point in my career, I had filed so many motions to suppress based on searches I thought were clearly illegal but I had never had a motion allowed by any judge. And I'd had a few where the judge made up facts, helpful to the police, not contained in the testimony I heard in court to justify their decisions against my clients. The system, the unfairness of it, was alienating and depressing. I closed the file, not having drafted a motion to suppress and surfed the internet for a while. When I reopened Francis' file to evaluate a possible trial, my assessment was not hopeful. Francis was alone driving a car registered to him. The drugs were found in his book bag with other stuff like his assignments with his name on them. Francis had an electronic scale in the bag too. That's what police and prosecutors call drug distribution paraphernalia. I wish that Francis was driving with other kids in the car or at least had the marijuana in an anonymous paper bag out of sight. Those were facts I could have worked with. It is what it is, I thought. Young kid mistakes, he's screwed. Again, I had the sense that there was nothing I could do. The unfairness of it angered me, but I also felt a kind of relief when I decided it was hopeless. If there was nothing I could do to change things, then I wasn't responsible for the outcome. It sucked, but it wasn't my fault. I went back to the internet. I had to read about sports teams I barely followed and check some weather reports for cities where I didn't live. A week later, Francis came to my office and explained that he lived with his older brother and they both worked in a parking garage to pay the rent. His parents were dead. This job was on top of going to school for Francis, who had decent grades too. He explained all this in a deep, calm voice, matter-of-factly, slowly, and deliberately. All this information and the way Francis expressed it impressed me and frightened me. Francis had a bright future and a lot to lose. I was afraid I couldn't help him given the nature of his case, and he was a kid who deserved my help. Finally, I proposed a strategy, and Francis agreed with it. 
My plan was to tell the judge about how Francis was a hardworking orphan who made the honor roll, then say that he didn't have any family in Uganda or know anyone there if he got deported. It would be less of a legal argument, more of a plea for mercy. I would say that Francis deserved one break, and that the case should be disposed of in a way that wouldn't get him kicked out of the country. The plan rested on the chances of drawing a sympathetic judge. Francis asked me if I thought it would work. I nodded and said it could work, since I knew there were judges who were kind enough that the defendant took responsibility. Still, it was a long shot, and I felt dishonest projecting optimism, but it was the only way forward I could see. Telling Francis he was doomed wasn't a good option. It would only worry him, and there was nothing he could do about his worries at that point. The die was cast and was out of his hands. There were three or four of us lawyers standing around drinking coffee and waiting for different sessions to open. I was complaining about my case. He's from Uganda or some shit, I said. <laughs> Is he naturalized? Asked a young lawyer. He was one of the official public defenders. Like most of the staff public defenders, he was earnest, hardworking, a true believer. No, he's not a citizen. You know, he explained, when drug dealers get sent back to some of those African countries, they get arrested at the airport and immediately imprisoned or executed on the spot. Why would you say that to me, I asked. <laughs> he shrugged. I don't know. Just thought you'd want to know. <laughs> Why, so I can get more upset? The public defender then asked, have you filed a motion to suppress? His question provoked me. It's considered disrespect when you challenge a fellow lawyer's work on a case, even implicitly. And he had such a tone. He spoke with the easy righteousness of zealous youth. No, I said. I didn't file a motion. He gave me a disapproving look, and I shook my head and turned to the door to go find the assistant district attorney. I had to ask him if he would agree to pretrial probation that didn't require a guilty plea and created no immigration problem. Hey, do you have that file in the pretrial session, auto stop case, possession of marijuana? You mean Francis, the ADA asked me? Yeah, that's the one. I was wondering what kind of deal you were thinking of. We will dismiss the school zone if he pleads guilty and does one year probation supervised, he said. I knew that if Francis took that plea, he could be deported. I asked the district attorney, would you consider pretrial probation for a year if the judge went along with it? The DA laughed at me. For possession with intent, no way, he said. I persisted. Thing is, the guy's from Africa, like he was brought over when he was only three, and he can get sent back there if he takes your offer. The assistant just returned when he shrugged. Maybe he should have thought of that before he started dealing drugs. Well, I might file a motion to suppress, I said, but I said it without confidence or conviction. If you file a motion and it's denied, then we won't dismiss the school zone charge and your client will be facing two years in jail. The district attorney then advised me, the search looked okay to me. I nodded and walked away. I had no leverage, really. I had to count on the judge to lean on the DA, which seemed unlikely. An hour later, Francis and I appeared in front of the judge with the ADA on the other side. It was Judge Rayburn. She made a point of thanking Francis for wearing a tie to court and asked if we would resolve the case that day by taking a plea. I told her we could not take the government's offer because my client had immigration issues. I was hoping we could do pretrial probation, even with strict terms in this case, I concluded. Where was your client born, the judge asked. In Uganda, I said, and it seemed like we might be in luck. Judge Rayburn turned to the ADA. You won't agree to pretrial probation? No, Your Honor, he replied. Even if I were to impose strict conditions, including 200 hours community service, the DA said, we won't dismiss the school zone count unless he pleads guilty to possession with intent. Judge Rayburn looked at me and shook her head. She made a few other suggestions to the DA to encourage him to be reasonable, but he would not relent. And since Francis could not make an admission, we had to take a further date for trial a few weeks later. The judge asked if I wanted the motions in trial date for possible, possible motions to suppress. But I said no, I wasn't filing a motion in the case. When Francis and I met in the hallway in front of the trial session a few weeks later, I was nervous, even though there was no chance of going to trial that day. The government had not sent me a drug certificate. Without a certificate from the lab, there could be no trial. The government wasn't ready. And that meant that we would be taking a further date. I was nerved up because I had no plausible theory on which to argue Francis's innocence at trial. 
or even that there was any doubt that he had drugs on him and that they were for sale. I wasn't sure how I would explain this to Francis. I didn't know how to tell him that the outcomes of tr criminal cases were driven by luck and accident, like a really bogus police search leading to evidence suppression. It had nothing to do with guilt or innocence or worthiness. I saw Francis sitting on a bench wearing a suit and tie. Hey, sir, I said, looking sharp. He regarded me thoughtfully. Yes, it's a big day. Maybe, I said, I'm not sure we're going to do much on the case today. Just then I heard the clerk's voice over the intercom. All parties with trial matters report to session two, the judges on the bench. That's us, I said. Then I gestured for Francis to get up and follow me into the courtroom. I sat at the table, morosely contemplating my case and its futility. I wanted to ask for dismissal for last lack of prosecution since the ADA wasn't ready, but I knew the judges always gave the government several trial dates to get the drug certificate before they would dismiss a distribution case. There wasn't any reason why the police and prosecutors had to be indulged in this way, but they always were. Then Judge Rayburn walked into the room and the court officer yelled, all rise. As I watched Judge Rayburn take her seat, I wondered vaguely if I should have filed the motion to suppress. I had pictured a lousy judge denying my motion. Judge Rayburn was okay though. Maybe she would have granted it. Not because it was a great motion, but just for the hell of it. I pushed the idea out of my mind. It was too late anyway. Then the court called our case. I got up and turned to Francis in the audience and waved up next to me at the podium. What are we doing today? Judge Rayburn asked. The ADA piped up. Your Honor, we're answering not ready for trial. The state crime lab hasn't completed the drug analysis and we're requesting a continuance to a further date, hopefully three months out, as there's a substantial backlog at the lab. Judge Rayburn looked at me. Counselor, please remind me, was I the judge at this defendant's pretrial hearing? Yes, Your Honor. What do you have to say about the district attorney's request for a continuance? I wasn't planning to request dismissal, since I figured it wouldn't be allowed, but suddenly it seemed worth a shot. Your Honor, today is the trial date. We are ready for trial today. If the government can't go forward, I would move to dismiss. Judge Rayburn looked over at the ADA. He said, Your Honor, this is only the first trial date. Judge Rayburn nodded at him. Then she wrote something down on the docket sheet and handed it to the clerk. Then the clerk turned to face us. This case stands dismissed for want of prosecution. I quickly said, thank you, Your Honor. Then she said, these drug certificates need to be expedited. I'm tired of wasting the court's time on repeated trial dates. It's unacceptable. A few minutes later, I was on the front steps of the courthouse with Francis. So that's it? It's over? Francis asked. Yeah, I think so, I said. I don't know how to thank you, Francis said. I'm not sure how much I did, I said, but I'm glad it worked out. <laughs>